So we're going to introduce the paired t-test. The paired t-test is a parametric approach, or a large sample approach, um, that's used to compare the means of two paired groups, compare two dependent groups, or matched groups. And the reason for pairing or matching is this reduces the biological variability between the two groups. Um, so for example, we might be looking at the same person measured under two different treatments. Or we may have the um, same individual measured before and then after receiving some treatment. Or in cases where we don't have the same individual, we might take someone who's in treatment A and we might match them with someone in treatment B. And usually we match on age, gender, or other variables that we think are um, important. So again, the idea behind this matching is to make the, the person in group A and group B as identical as possible. So we're going to take a look at this example here, the simplest form of uh, paired data, the before and after experiment. So we're going to look at um, individuals having their systolic blood pressure measured before receiving some treatment, and then measured again after receiving that treatment. And we're going to use a simple data set, only 11 observations here. And again, this is so that we can see all the data on the screen and um, focus on the concepts, not the calculations. So um, our goal here is to, to measure, does this, is this drug effective in decreasing systolic blood pressure? So to try and visualize this, we can make side-by-side -side box plots, comparing the before measurements and the after measurements. Or we can make this form of paired plot, where we connect each before measurement to the after measurement using a line which helps us see if they're trending downwards or upwards. So ultimately our question is, is this drug effective? And the way that we'll define that is by looking at, does the mean systolic blood pressure decrease after treatment? We can also look at, does the median decrease? And we'll do that in following videos using slightly different approaches. Earlier we learned the underlying concepts of hypothesis testing and confidence intervals. And we're going to lean on that understanding here to build up a hypothesis test and a confidence interval for two paired groups. So what we're about to talk about is known as the paired t-test. So here we'd like to test the null hypothesis that the mean systolic blood pressure after is the same as the mean before. Or we can also write this as the difference in after and before is equal to zero. Right, again, signifying no difference or no change. And recall that in hypothesis testing, we start by assuming our null is true and then see if we can provide evidence against that. The alternative hypothesis is that the mean after is less than the mean before. And we talked previously about one versus two-sided test. We'll do a one-sided test here um, for simplicity, but we could easily write this as a, a two-sided if we preferred that. We can also write this as the difference in after minus before is less than zero, right? meaning on average there was a decrease. You'll notice here that the reason we um, prefer to express it this way rather than this way is here we've boiled it down to a single number being our estimate, the difference in means. And remember we learned how to test hypotheses or build confidence intervals and they generally relied on this concept. Um, let's take a confidence interval for example. Take our estimate and tack on a margin of error, right? Our estimate plus or minus about two standard errors of the estimate. Okay, and now this is our estimate here. One thing that you'll notice is that this data is paired, right? We have measurements before and we have measurements after. So we could consider looking at the change, okay, or the difference. So let's add that in here. If we look at the change or the difference, You'll notice that taking the um, after measurement minus the before measurement, we're going to end up with negative 8 for the, person, the first person. Right? We've had a decrease of 8. For the second person, we've got an increase of 3, a decrease of 6, an increase of 3, a decrease of 15, a decrease of 4, a decrease of 12, an increase of 8, a decrease of 22, a decrease of 4, and a decrease of 11. Okay, so one thing to note here is now we've essentially put ourselves back in the um, same scenario as the one sample t-test that we learned about earlier. Right? Rather than looking at before measurements and after measurements, since they're paired, we can take advantage of that and look at the change and care of the difference. 
Now we've got this single variable here. We can calculate the mean for these. So I'm going to label that d bar. And here the average dif average difference. Right. And we can sum from i going 1 to n each of the individual differences divided by the sample size. We're calculating the average of these differences here. And you're going to find that comes out to negative 6.18. So on average, there was a decrease of about 6.18 after treatment. We can also calculate the standard deviation of these. Okay, and again, a reminder of the standard deviation. It tells us on average, how far are individual differences moving from that mean. So I can label that little s of d. Okay, the standard deviation of the differences. And if you were to work that out, you're going to find it comes out to be 8.76. Okay, so now rather than um, comparing the mean after to the mean before, right, we've noted we can take this difference. So we can express the null hypothesis that the mean difference is zero. First, an alternative hypothesis that the mean difference is less than zero, right? Or on average, there was a decrease. So again, as mentioned earlier, we're in the case of doing the one sample t-test, we can use the exact same approach as here. So first we can think, if our null hypothesis is true, and again, if the null is true, if on average there really is um, no change or no difference, how likely are we to get a sample difference of 6.18 or more by chance? Okay, and again, we're here we're going to look in the one tail because we're doing a um, one, one tailed or one sided hypothesis test. We could easily do the two sided test if we preferred that. Same approach we used earlier. Our test statistic looks at how far is the difference we saw in our sample from what we hypothesize the difference to be in terms of a standard error. Again, how far is the negative 6.18 from what we expected? Right, we'd expect it to be zero if the null is true in terms of a standard error. And again, we built up this concept, the standard deviation of individuals divided by the square root of the sample size. Okay, and again, as we've also mentioned repeatedly, repeatedly throughout this series of videos, we don't want to focus too much on the exact calculations We'll be doing most of this stuff with software. Um, we want to focus on the concepts of what are we actually trying to do with these, these tests. So here we'll find our test statistics comes out to negative 2.34. And again, a reminder of this value. This is telling us the estimate we got in our sample is about 2.34 standard errors below what we'd expect it should be if the null is true, if there's no change in mean blood pressure after receiving the treatment. Once we've calculated this test statistic, we said it follows a t distribution with a particular degrees of freedom. Again, in this case, it's going to be n minus 1. That sample estimate is 2.34 standard errors below the mean or what we'd expect if the null is true. And if you find this value um, from a t table or using a piece of software, you're going to find it comes out to be approximately 0.0207 or 2.07%. Okay, and again, a reminder of, of this p-values interpretation. If our null hypothesis is true, if there's no change in average blood pressure after receiving the treatment, there's only about a 2% chance of us seeing um, a difference or an average decrease of 6.18 or more by chance. We've already seen how we can use the p-value to uh, make a decision. Right here we'd say um, our p-value is quite small. We're going to end up rejecting our null hypothesis and saying we have evidence to believe the alternative is likely true. Okay, we have evidence to believe on average there is a um, statistically significant decrease in blood pressure after receiving treatment. Now, as we've also mentioned, it's always nice to pair a hypothesis test with a confidence interval. They give us slightly different pieces of information about the same problem. Okay, so a reminder, we can make those um, by going from our estimate plus or minus about two standard errors of the estimate. So let's make a 95% confidence interval. And I guess I should explicitly say the plus or minus two standard errors corresponds to 
We can change if we want 99% confidence and go up slightly more than two. Okay, but again, let's not focus on the exact number, let's focus on the concept. So here we can go from our estimate, plus or minus T value, which is going to be roughly two standard errors of the estimate. Our estimate is negative 6.18, plus or minus the exact value is 2.22. Okay, but again, like I said, let's not get stuck on this value. We can find it in the table or software will do the exact calculation for us. Times the standard error, 8.76 over square root of 11. And if we work that out, that's going to give us an interval of negative 12.1 to negative 0.30. Okay. So the way we can interpret this, we're 95% confident that on average, the systolic blood pressure after treatment is somewhere between 0.3 to 12.1 lower than it was before. You can also take note when looking at this confidence interval that zero is not in there. Okay, and again, this tells us we're not um, willing to accept that the difference may be zero. Now notice that this falls in line with our hypothesis test where we said we have evidence to believe that the change is significantly different from zero. Okay, again here, since all of the values are negative, we're fairly confident that there is a decrease. Also, I'll bring you back to a reminder of um, statistical significance versus scientific or clinical significance. Is a decrease on average of 12 units in blood pressure meaningful? That probably is. Is a decrease of 0.3 units biologically, um, scientifically, or clinically meaningful? It may or may not be. Okay, so um, statistical significance versus clinical or scientific significance, they are slightly different um, concepts, and you want to make sure you separate the two. Um, it's also, I guess, worth noting, here I did a two-sided confidence interval. Up here we did a one-sided hypothesis test. Okay, for them to be perfectly in line with each other, we should either do a one-sided confidence interval or a two-sided test. Um, but like I said, I, I prefer to do the two-sided confidence interval. I think having an upper and lower bound is a bit nicer. Um, if you preferred, you could do the two-sided test here. Right? P-value would double to 4.14%. We also said we don't want to get too stuck on you know, P-value is 4% versus 6% and reject or fail to reject. Right? P-value is a guide. It's not a magic number that um, tells us if something is significant or not. I guess some final things to close on. Like all um, statistical methods, this has some assumptions that go along with it. They're the same as what they were for the one sample t-test. But let's put them here explicitly. Okay. To do this, it assumes we have a simple random sample. We have independent observations, meaning person one, their systolic blood pressure is independent of person number two, and so on. We have paired, or we have dependent groups. And finally, we have a large sample size, or the change, okay, or the difference we saw, are approximately normal, or normally distributed. Okay, so again, this is an assumption that's in pretty much all of these parametric methods, that we have a large sample size or um, normally distributed data. So let's talk just very quickly about what happens if this assumption isn't met. What if we don't have a large sample size? What if we can't assume that the differences are approximately normal? Or what if rather than testing about means, we want to test the hypothesis about medians? Okay, so some approaches we can do is use um, non-parametric approaches. Um, for example, the Wilcoxon signed rank test. Okay, and that's something we're going to talk about in a separate video. Or we could try using a bootstrapping or resampling type approach um, as well. When we don't have large sample sizes, we can't assume normality. Or we want to test hypotheses about something other than means. Hope you guys liked the video. Subscribe to our channel. Like our videos. Stick around guys, because we got a lot more. Statistics is hard to say, Poopali. No, it's not poopali.